joining tonight Robin Broad and John Cavana, authors of The Water Defenders, How Ordinary People Saved a Country from Corporate Greed. They are a husband and wife team who have been involved in the Salvadoran gold mining saga since 2009. Broad is an expert in international development, winning a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship for her work on this project. A professor at American University, she served as an international economist in the US, US Treasury Department, US Congress, and at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Havana is director of the Washington DC-based Institute for Policy Studies, an organization that collaborates with the Poor People's Campaign and other dynamic social movements to turn ideas into action for peace, justice, and the environment. Previously, he worked with the United Nations to research corporate power. The Water Defenders tells the David and Goliath story of community groups in El Salvador and their international allies rallying together to prevent a global mining corporation from poisoning the country's main water source. Recently, it won the Duke, I'm sorry, the Duke University Juan Mendez Human Rights Book Award of 2021 and was named to the Best Books 2021 list by Foreign Affairs and the Favorite Books of 2021 list by the Progressive Magazine. Please welcome Robin and John. You guys take it away. Thank you. And thanks to our devoted audience here. So it's truly a pleasure to be here today, albeit virtually. Special thanks to Lindsay and to her predecessor, Chris, who put this event together. Um, and a shout out to you all who are in the audience and to Palm Beach County and surrounding areas. John and I are delighted that technology allows us to be with you today, but we're sorry that we can't be there in person. Actually, we know the Palm Beach County area well. Um, my mother's family relocated to Florida in the 1940s, and my parents in their later years became, went back and forth between New Hampshire and Palm, Boynton Beach. So of course, a wonderful Palm Beach County Library branch was always one of our stops when we visited with our then young son. So truly, thank you, uh, those of you in Palm Beach for bringing back those memories. As for tonight, as John and I planned for tonight, we decided that the best way to introduce our book and these issues to you was first to get you into the story in the same way that we got into it, then to pull out some of the major themes, issues, questions that we found ourselves grappling with as we, as we wrote and as we reconstructed what turned out to be more than 13 years of events. Um, and of course, leaving time to dive into your questions. So as we began in 2009, I'm going to read to begin as we began in 2009, I'm going to read excerpts from the introduction to the Water Defenders for about 10 minutes. For nearly two weeks, Marcelo Rivera's family could not find him. Then on June 29th, 2009, they received the phone call they had been dreading. The anonymous caller was brief. There was a body in an old abandoned well just west of the Rivero hometown of San Isidro Cabanas. The well was near the spot where Marcelo had last been seen some 12 days earlier, getting off the bus at a turnoff to the capital city. During those 12 days, Marcelo's family and friends had been at wit's end, searching frantically, desperately for him. They had spread the news of his disappearance to, in all the barrios of San Isidro and nearby towns. They had even called the police for over a week to no avail. The Rivera fi family finally in desperation filed a former complaint with the country's attorney general, pleading for him to search to conduct a search and an investigation into Marcelo's disappearance. But another poor person gone missing up in the rural north meant little to the authorities. After the anonymous tip to Marcelo's family, 
the police finally acted. They pulled the remains of a body out of the dry, 30-meter deep well. So extensive was the torture that the body was unrecognizable. The face was grotesquely disfigured. No jaw, no lips, no nose. The fingernails had been ripped off, the testicles bound. The trachea had been broken with a nylon cord. In the assessment of the coroner, the death had been caused by asphyxiation. The public prosecutor disagreed, concluding that the death had come from blows to the head by a hammer. Whatever the cause of death, the torture bore eerie similarity to that inflicted by right-wing death squads during the 20 years of El Salvador's gruesome civil war from 1980 to 1992. Thus, Marcelo Rivera became the first of several water defenders to be assassinated in the 21st century fight over mining in El Salvador. Though we never met Marcelo, we have been haunted by him and the circumstances of his death ever since. Who killed Marcelo and why? Perhaps you know the difference between a tortilla and a pupusa, or perhaps, like we had done, you are entering the story without a clue. Perhaps El Salvador is not even on your radar screen, or perhaps El Salvador is on your radar screen, not, but only because of gangs or immigrants who trek north. But really, that does not matter. This is certainly, on one level, a story about El Salvador. At the same time, it is not just about El Salvador. This is a David versus Goliath story about a battle between a country and a foreign mining company. But it is also about how global corporations, be they big gold or big pharma or big tobacco or big oil or big banks, move into poorer communities around the world, around the world. Marcelo's story, before and after his murder, is about the struggle for clean and affordable water everywhere. It is also a story about workers and communities defending their air and their land, their health and their climate and their rights to defend themselves against corporate incursion. It's a story about how to prioritize those rights and the common good versus the usual prioritization of the profits of big corporations and their owners. It is certainly a story about gold and when and why we should leave it in the ground, but it could also be about coal or natural gas or other fossil fuels, about whether we measure progress in aggregate financial terms or through the well-being of people and the planet, and about who gets to make those decisions that affect our lives. To say that the story of the water defenders versus big gold holds keys to reversing the out, outsized power of big corporations today is not an exaggeration. You may find yourself surprised by the relevance of the strategies of the water defenders in El Salvador whether your focus is a Walmart near you, a fracking company trying to expand in Texas or Pennsylvania, or petrochemical companies around New Orleans. Along the way, however cliched the quote attributed to Margaret Mead may have become, you may also find yourself inspired by a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens who stand up to corporate power. We first heard of Marcelo in May 2009, just a month before his murder. He was a 37-year-old teacher who directed his hometown's cultural center, an avid reader, a person who loved the theater and the arts, and a good practical joke. We heard his name because he was a leader of the main coalition of Salvadoran groups opposed to mining, the National Roundtable on Mining in El Salvador, or La Mesa. The round table was not well known outside of El Salvador, but we learned about it because the group had been chosen to receive a prestigious human rights award from the Institute for Policy Studies, where John works. In 2009, the Institute selected the round table to honor its opposition to mining companies eager to exploit the gold deposits near El Salvador's major river. On a misty night in October 2009, just months after Marcelo's body was pulled from that well, hundreds gathered in the National Press Club in downtown Washington, D.C. to meet and applaud the Salvadoran water defenders. 
Among them was Marcelo's youngest brother and best friend, Miguel. Miguel had come in his brother's place. Grief marked his face. Accepting the award on behalf of Miguel and three other roundtable leaders was a peasant and community leader from the heart of gold country, Vidalina Morales. Vidalina looked small behind the podium. She at first appeared hesitant, nervous before the large audience, fragile even. Then she began to speak. Her words filled the auditorium almost as though she did, need not, she did not need the microphone. For nearly 20 minutes, Vidalina held the crowd spellbound as she relayed the saga of El Salvador's water defenders standing up to big gold. The Lempa River, she explained, winds through the country like a snake, providing water for over half the population. Water for drinking, for fishing, for farming water for the cities as well as for the rural areas. But the project of the Canadian headquartered Pacific Rim Mining Corporation at its proposed El Dorado site near in Miguel and Marcelo's hometown posed serious threats to the Lampa River. Key among the threats was the toxic cyanide that Pac Rim would use to separate the gold from the rock. Vidalina ended her acceptance speech with a seemingly audacious demand that the government of El Salvador stand up to giant mining firm firms and choose water over gold by banning the mining of all metals. All metals. Before this, she had urged the audience to follow a related legal thriller unfolding four blocks to the west of where we sat, just past the White House to the site of a little-known tribunal in Washington, D.C. There, as Vidalina explained, Pacrim had filed a lawsuit against the government of El Salvador just before Marcelo's murder. Pacrim claimed that El Salvador had either to allow it to mine or to pay it over $300 million in costs and foregone profits from future mining. Vitalina invoked the upside-down world summoned by Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano in asking why it was not El Salvador suing Pac Rim since the mining company threatened the water and well-being of the country. But that upside-down world is the reality of global corporate power and economic rules that affect people all around the globe. And as we too think back to that evening, we must admit that we each, separately and silently, found it just as far-fetched to imagine a national legislature passing a law to end mining as it was to conceive of this tribunal siding with Vidalina and the rest of the water defenders. At the reception following the award ceremony, we huddled with Marcelo's brother Miguel. Miguel was soft-spoken and gentle in his manner understandably a bit shy as he asked for help. After all, we had just met. Miguel seemed both incredibly focused on the details of what to do next and shell-shocked by the chain of events, by his brother's murder and by the lawsuit. But his appeal was urgent, direct, and heartfelt. We don't know this tribunal or how it works. We don't know what to expect. Can you help us find out about this lawsuit? On that misty night in October 2009, who could have guessed that Miguel, Miguel's questions and Vitalina's call to action would pull us two and thousands of others around the world into the vortex of three intertwined unknowns <coughs> for nearly a decade to come? First, there was the on the ground mystery who killed Marcelo Rivera and why? Not just who carried out the brutal killer, killing, but who was the mastermind? Secondly, there was the mystery at the national level. Could little El Salvador possibly become the first nation on earth to ban mining or at least move closer to that goal? 
Or did all this hoopla about stopping mining simply mean, as many assumed in 2009, that Pakram had not paid a high enough bribe to top officials in the national government? And finally, there was the global legal thriller. Could little El Salvador possibly prevail against the global mining industry in Washington, DC? Would economically poor El Salvador even have enough money to pay for its legal and related costs? Enough money to hire a lawyer savvy enough to take on what would undoubtedly be a top corporate law team hired by Pac Rim. We too had no idea in 2009 how these mysteries would play out. But as we joined the hundreds of people who streamed, steam, streamed out of the National Press Club after the award ceremony, we knew we were hooked. We knew we needed to find out more about this tribunal, at least a day or two of research to answer Miguel's questions. And we were intrigued by the prospect, however unlikely, that an economically poorer country might actually choose to halt mining to save its water. Now let me turn to John, who's going to share more of our collaborative reflections on some of the big questions and lessons that this work and this book have raised for us. And then I will return for some final reflections before we open this up to questions and conversations. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robin, and great to be here with you all tonight. And special thanks to the Palm Beach County Library. And I must say, as I was sitting here listening to Robin tell this story, which of course we wrote together, so I know it well, I was thrown back to the fact that these two brothers you've just met, Miguel and Marcelo Rivera, began their public life by deciding they wanted to build a library. They wanted to create a library. They were in a town that had no library. The closest library was half an hour away. And so they, no, they didn't have a building either, but they went around, collected books, built a little library. Uh, their mother let them build a, a library in their living room. And when they got over 30 books, she told them, you need a, another solution. And they went into the town. I mean, this is, you get the sense of two people who are, who are destined for bigger, greater things. And they convinced the town government to give them a building that was right there on the town square. Uh, long story of how they did that, but they then started the library um, and a cultural center there. And Robin and I, when we went recently, brought kids books in Spanish that and it's still a, a vibrant library. It's now called the Marcelo Rivera Cultural Center. Um, let me just say too, I, I, the way that Robin and I were able to do 10 years of work around this is Robin is a, of course a professor and I work at a, an institute that does research and writing for community groups and social movements to push for um, change that, that advances justice and peace and the environment. And so certainly wouldn't I, would not have been able to do this without that institution. Now, let me jump straight to the spoiler alerts on these three questions Robin left us with. And um, so, and good news on two of them, which is first in March, 2017, yes, El Salvador did become the first country in the world to ban all metals mining to save its rivers, its legislature, agreed to do this or did this through a unanimous vote, uh, which is amazing in any country, very amazing in this country. And then six months earlier in October, 2016, the secretive World Bank Tribunal voted unanimously against the mining company uh, that sued El Salvador. So also amazing, uh, two huge wins and um, so you're wondering, I hope, how in the world did they pull this off? Um, I'll say a little bit about that. But one thing I just wanna say for any of you who don't know about mining, I mean, we sit here surrounded by metals and all of the things that we're sitting on and that, that we're typing on and that we're using in our phones. And most people don't realize, just I'll say a word about mining and its relationship to water. It's not a good relationship. One, mining requires a huge amount of water, uh, first of all. Secondly, 
you use toxic chemicals to separate, in this case, the gold from the surrounding rock. They use cyanide there, which is toxic. And third, when you expose the rock that these precious minerals are in to air and water, in about half of the mines around the world, there's sulfides in there. And when sulfides get exposed to water, they turn into, into sulfuric acid and they leach whatever is around them in that rock into the ground and into the surrounding rivers. And that brings in, in some cases, arsenic, in some cases, iron, and uh, it can create problems. There are mines that the Romans opened in Spain 2000 years ago, which are still leaching toxic materials into the soil. So it costs a lot of money to remediate uh, the areas after mining. Something we never think about when, when actually our lives are so integrated with um, mining. Okay, so how'd they do it? And, and then what might that teach us for other things? Um, there are lots of different lessons, but Robin and I distilled them into just three. And so let me say what they are first. In these fights where people are fighting, in this case, to save their water and their land, um, well-organized community groups are the key to this. And Miguel and Marcelo and Vitalina organized one in their hometown. Um, they also then did something which any smart people would do in this situation. They realized they didn't know much about mining. In the, in the beginning, they thought it sounded great. The mining companies come in and say, we're going to mine, we're going to create lots of jobs, and we'll bring prosperity. And so they said, we need to study this. And they, one, went to their library, and then two, went to surrounding communities. They're right across the river from Honduras. They went over and visited big mines there. They had a, a big mine that it was in the east of the country, set up over a hundred years ago. They went on an excursion there and what they saw really shocked them. They saw the fact that the remains from the mining, the tailings were in these giant pools that had contaminated the water and land around them that in the streams around the mine, all the fish were dead. Um, they saw people with sores on their hands from, from uh, being in that water. And they learned the dangers. Uh, they studied some of them, the hydrology, others of them, the social impacts. And they became convinced that this would be terrible for their communities. And in a small country, as Robin said, with one big river system that supplies water to half of the people, they realized they, they needed to stop it. They then did amazing education. And in most communities, you have to be, some people like to go to forums, some people like to go to their library, uh, others though don't. So they, they worked with community, amazing community radio station there that is run by youth in, in the area. They did marches, they integrated culture. Uh, Marcella was a master of, of uh, marches that were fun, where one where everybody wore a clown nose, and they did education around these events. So that's one thing. You, you likely won't win anything if you can't organize your communities uh, that will be the ones that will be affected. Secondly, um, again, water is something that most of us take for granted. In this country, you just turn on a faucet and, and you get water. Um, you don't pay in most places a huge amount for it, uh, but everybody depends on it. And so what they found here is that playing up the obvious critical nature of water to everyone was key. And they found that it was much better to, to plan their campaign with positive messages than negative messages. So they led with water is life. Um, we can live without gold, but we can't live without water. And that rallied um, a large number of people. And finally, third, when you're up against a big, uh, a big entity, in this case, a very big mining company that's determined to come in and do something in your community, you've got to organize all your likely allies, as well as in a country 
that is their country is as divided politically as our country is. You, you've got to find some unlikely allies or you're not going to win. So they did the obvious with the likely allies. They found environmental groups. They found faith groups in that country, student groups, women's groups, uh, farmers groups that would be affected, whose land would be affected. And they found those counterparts internationally. It was wonderful when they came to Washington and Robin and I and, and my institute uh, helped bring people together from, from around the world to join in this, to put pressure on the company and to put pressure on this tribunal. But uh, so in our country, in order to win something in Congress, you've got to get, uh, well, you've got, you've got to get a majority and some things you have to get more than a majority. And it's very hard. In El Salvador, two thirds of the people in the legislature when this fight began and throughout the fight, were from very conservative parties that were very pro-big companies, pro-big mining companies in the beginning. And so most people wouldn't even have started the fight. They would have just said, we're gonna lose. They said, no, let's, let's, let's be creative here. And I, we love pulling these stories out of people and that's a lot of what's in the book. But for example, there was an incredibly conservative archbishop in El Salvador at this time. Uh, and very, they thought pro, well, they knew pro business, but, and he, so, but they said, let's go for him because if we can get him, then we get the churches and in a country that is overwhelmingly Catholic where, where priests give sermons on Sunday, if they're giving sermons on water and the need to protect it from mining companies, that would go a long way. And they tried and tried, this guy was blowing them off. He wasn't returning their calls. He refused to meet with them. Finally, he gave in. They start meeting with him. He's not paying any attention to them. And then one of them mentioned Sinai. And all of a sudden he lights up and he said, oh my God, why didn't you say that before? I have a, I have a degree in chemistry and I know that Sinai would be a disaster to this country. And he became an ally and he allowed them to come and do educational events for priests. And pretty soon you have the Catholic Church on your side. Um, so that's one example. Another is the party that would be the equivalent of, I guess, the Republican Party in this country. Uh, they didn't think that they would get anyone there. It turns out there was a wonderful young guy who'd actually come to college in the U.S. in Washington and had learned, studied some about the environment, learned about mining problems. And I don't know if any of you remember this, but but about five years ago, he was in school when there was a big headline, at least in our newspaper, with kind of a shocking photo, which is that the Environmental Protection Agency had been poking around in a mine in Colorado, a hundred year old mine, uh, to clean it up and so on. And they poke through a wall and all of a sudden, millions of gallons of deeply contaminated uh, water it was the color of bright yellow. It was like the crayon yellow. Came pouring out into a river that then went into a giant river that goes through Southern Colorado, that then goes through Northern New Mexico, and then that shoots up and goes into Utah. And for three weeks, it was solid yellow water. And he'd seen this. And so he then went to forums of these groups and educated himself from a very conservative party he was on the Environment Committee in Congress and he became opposed. Um, there was, I mean, one little thing that Robin uh, played a big role in was the mining company was saying, look, all these people are saying we'll be bad for the rivers. We're great, we're a sustainable mining company. If you could just see our mine in the Philippines, you'd know it and you would, your opposition would go away. Well, Robin and I have spent a lot of time in the Philippines <laughs> and we knew this, the mine of this mining company up in the north that we knew it was a disaster. It was a giant open pit. All the problems that these people had seen when they went to mines in Honduras were there. And so we helped arrange to have the governor of that province where the mine was, a guy who we knew opposed the mine, really smart guy who was a farmer, fly halfway around the world to El Salvador and come and he testified before Congress. He testified before big community forums. Uh, he even went and met the president, and he he was a bit of a game changer in the there as well. So that's what 
it, by the end of it, they were able to get the majority of people in Congress. They, they actually got a unanimous vote to, to ban mining and they won and they also won the lawsuit. Um, let me end just with a couple of other thoughts here in terms of you, you may have questions or know where you wanna go, but just two things. One, for any of you who've spent any time in the rest of the world in particular in Latin America, you might be asking, is this a one in a million sort of shot or are other countries learning from this and moving in a similar direction? Um, the good news is, and it's interesting in a world where there's, you know, you turn on the TV and you're not feeling much good news. In Latin America, there's, there's quite a bit. And a number of countries have listened to communities concerned about all of these problems that come with, with mining, and they've started to restrict, uh, cut back on mining. No one else has completely banned it like El Salvador, but, but Costa Rica, which has built its economy around uh, ecotourism and national parks, uh, has banned open pit mining. Big restrictions in Panama, Argentina, Colombia. Um, and uh, all of a sudden last year, these movements, got big enough so that they began to influence national elections. And I don't know, some of you may have seen this, like two months ago, Vice President Harris went down to the inauguration of a new president in Honduras, a woman named Xiomara Castro. She was elected with big support from groups that wanted to limit mining in Honduras, uh, which had opened itself up hugely to mining. Um, she won, and just recently, um, further south in a country that, that my institute has a long history with in Chile, um, a guy who was a student leader just 10 years ago, so 35 years old, Gabriel Boric, won the presidency of that country. Again, critical about mining and its impacts, a, a really good environmentalist. And they're going through a constitutional convention in that country that is going to uh, enshrine the rights of water and, and of nature in their constitution, a country led by largely people in their 1930s. So if you're, if you're looking for a place to feel good about and check into, it's, it's, uh, it's Chile. And also, I just want to say, I know some of you uh, tuning in here tonight are from the great state of Florida. A country whose, I mean, a, a state whose entire history is wrapped up in fights over water. You've got, of course, just southwest of you there in Palm Beach, um, one of the biggest, most precious wetlands in the world, not just the United States and the Everglades, and which was deeply polluted starting in the 1960s by phosphorus from giant sugar. Uh, agribusiness farms and other farms. Um, and again, I, this is, I, you, some of you know this history better, I'm sure than Robin and I do, but the similarities are fascinating. I'll just end with this, with, with El Salvador, community groups came together, uh, concerned about what this meant and worried about it and began to organize in the 70s, 80s, 90s in and, and Florida. Um, they did use positive slogans around water and of course the incredible wildlife uh, and flora and fauna in, in the Everglades. They did find unlikely allies because a lot of people in the business community were hurt by this. There's a huge, of course, tourism industry in Florida, um, recreation industry in Florida. And, and so people from the business community stepped up and said, we've got to do something about this. And there was, you know, a major act passed in 2000 that brought both federal funding and state funding into a whole series of measures that have helped restore some of the Everglades. I know it's an ongoing fight and when the state government in Florida is out of money, uh, things go back a little bit, but, but it is, it's a story that has a lot of positives and a lot of similarities. And, and there's stories like that all over the country and, and all over the world. Okay, so um, let me just pass it back for a, a closing reflection from Robin and then we'd love to chat about any of this, any aspects of this that you wanna pick up on. So Robin. So I was going to add some final reflections and odds and ends and 
talk more, but given the intimate size of this group, let me, let me not do that. Instead, let me simply say that we're happy to talk more in depth about any of this. We're interested in hearing your stories about water. Um, and we are also happy, to, since this event is called Writers Live, we're also happy to talk about the writing of this book, about why it was we chose to use narrative nonfiction for this book, how it was that we got access to, well, clearly it was, it was relatively easier for us to get access to the voices and the confidence of the water defenders, although we did spend many, many visits in El Salvador gaining that confidence, but we also had access to troves of documents from the mining companies, even though they refused to talk to us. So I'm happy to talk, we're happy to talk to you intrepid researchers about ways to get such information. Um, we're also happy to talk about how it is that we, we write together and stay married. Um, we've been married for 40 years now. We've written, this is our, we've written a number of books. This is our first narrative nonfiction book. Um, and on that note, let me, let me, Close before I turn it back to Lindsay. Let me um, with humbly say that we're also delighted to announce that a Spanish language edition of this book has just gone to press in Mexico City. That will be available all over South America and in Spain. The paperback is just being released worldwide. A Philippine edition is out as is an audio book, and we couldn't be more thrilled. Um, then by having the story of Marcelo and the other water defenders bring, we hope, hope to similar communities around the world. So over to you, Lindsay. All right, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for sharing about the book coming out in Spanish language. That's certainly very interesting. Um, everyone, you are welcome to type any questions or thoughts you might have in the chat. I'm monitoring the chat box. Or since we are a manageable group, do feel free to unmute yourself and, and chime in and talk directly with our authors. Hi, Lindsay. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, sorry, my son's practicing piano. Um, I was kind of curious about the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher. I love doing research. Um, as far as getting access to the documents that the, you know, when the mining company didn't want to talk to you, I don't know anything about uh, like Freedom of Information Act in El Salvador. Like, how did you, how did you get these documents? Let me, let me start on that. I don't know. Johnny and I have we just figure out how to go back and forth or how not to go back and forth. But um, we were, there are a number of things of, in this story that are either, um, spur, that seem like serendipity and some of you might call it fate in any case. Things came together. So we actually tried to interview the mining company and they wouldn't talk to us. They wouldn't, in the Philippines, they brag that they will allow anyone to come visit the, the plant, um, they would not let us come. And we actually, obviously we could not write this book or we didn't feel like we could write this book unless we got the mining company's voices. Um, because we wanted to show them not just as evil people intent to destroy water, rivers and, and land, um, we wanted to really understand their motivations and how they saw things versus how the water defenders saw things. So the answer is we got lucky. We got three, this from three sources. When, because of the lawsuit, at the, because of the arbitration case at the World Bank Group, um, a number of these documents became available and the Salvadoran government and the lead lawyer who became one of the unlikely lawyer allies he was a he was a former military guy in el salvador who went to west point and then 
um, but, but was one of those who spoke truth after the Civil War in El Salvador. So we got access to those, those documents, which included emails within the main company, PACRIM, um, e emails and communications between companies. It included an appeal to the Pope to have the Pope stop, um, to have the Pope silence the pesky archbishop, the guy who was the chemist who wasn't against mining except because it used cyanide. So we got that. And then um, I had a, a, um, a student who's now Dr. Rachel Edelman, who did her dissertation, who was my research assistant when she was a PhD student. And she went down to El Salvador to do research. And um, some of you will appreciate this story. Um, more than others, but she was in El Salvador doing research. She's, she's Jewish, and she wasn't getting enough research done. And she was feeling really guilty, but she wanted to go to the high holiday service in San Salvador. And so feeling guilty she, because she should have been doing research, she went anyways. And there she met a woman from the US who took a liking to her, this poor um, graduate student from the US, and she, this woman invited her to dinner. Well, it turned out the husband was one of the mining executives trying to mine in Northern El Salvador. And he didn't ask Rachel what her politics was. He just said, oh, I have a box of documents that I've been saving. I have no idea why I've been saving them, but God must m have meant for me to give them to you. So, she used a tiny bit of it for her dissertation, and then since he didn't put any restrictions on her use of the documents, she then shared them with us. And finally, because you asked about the Freedom of Information Act, um, we had no faith whatsoever in the Freedom of Information Act in, in El Salvador, but there is a Freedom of, Ma of Information Act, and we and Rachel were actually able to get some of the government documents using that. And um, I should add, probably getting it more quickly than we would have had, had this been in the US using the Freedom of Information Act. So the, I don't know, the answer is we were just lucky and that, that different venues turned out to work. The final thing I will say is actually, we were really lucky because we had this all in writing. So if we had done interviews with the mining company, mining companies sue. We were actually really worried that the mining companies would find out we were writing this book and would sue the publisher to at least stall its publication. Um, and so the fact that we had all this in writing and they couldn't dis could not dispute what we were writing made us feel somewhat safer. And knock on wood, so far, no lawsuit. Thank you. Uh, Robin, you did get a question come through the chat. Larry asks, what's your typical day look like when you're working together on a book? I'll let John start that, but you should probably take us into separate breakout rooms and see if we give totally different answers. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I've never written anything of any substance alone. So I don't know what it's like to write alone. And I know many of you are writers uh, here. And so I'd love you to teach that to me. What I find, and, and as Robin said, we've written several books together. We will start out with um, major conversation about, well, once we figured out the overall map of this book, and this one, since it's told as a story through narrative nonfiction, um, that took a while to, to put together the whole book. And one thing to say, Robin mentioned, we enter it in 2009. It turns out the, the fight in these communities and the education and so on started in 2004. So a lot of what we did over those 10 years was go back and interview people about what had happened in the early years. But for us together, we sit down with a nice cup of coffee and we plot out what we think a chapter should, should look like. We then take all the materials we have. So those boxes from Rachel, um, we had a lot of press 
uh, materials. We both take notes in these cool little, like a reporter in these cool little notebooks. So we had our notes from interviews and we think through what are the pieces that will be necessary to tell the story of that, uh, of that chapter. Um, I write faster, but not as well as Robin. <laughs> Robin agonizes over words. So I do the first drafts in most cases. Um, and Robin then makes them beautiful prose. And then we go back and forth a lot of times. And finally, I'll just say in a book like this, where you're telling the story of other people's lives, we felt it really important to pass a lot of what we were doing past them. So, and these are people who speak um, only Spanish. So as we had advanced drafts, we had them translated into Spanish and we sent them to the core people down there, Miguel, Vitalina, uh, and one other, and um, read them and went down and spent days going through them with them uh, to make sure that what we were writing was, was accurate. Robin, so I don't know I, if you want to. I'm add just going to. So John makes it sound so I don't know, so copacetic. So mm -hmm. like we just sit there and we have fun and we love each other's <laughs> ideas. Totally and, fun, yeah. <laughs> so it's um, there are times when it's really tense. I mean, there are we I now I, now we know the life cycle of how we write together. At a certain point, John will say, "This is really good." And I'll say, boy, that's, it's really lousy. And <laughs> um, no, John say, no, will say, no, no, it's really good. And I'll say, we are nowhere near where we need to be. Um, and I now know I need to take a walk around the block. But, but it's really, it's also really wonderful to write together because, to write with someone else. Because when you write by yourself, you can think a sentence or a paragraph is really beautiful. And then... When you're doing it together, you really have to polish it and, and make it work. So you'll have someone before a, reader in, before a reader who says, you know, this sentence doesn't make sense at all. Um, but um, by the time we go back and forth so much, so John, John, we usually start by doing an outline together that then is expanded. But um, by the time it's finished, we, our fights are over who actually wrote which sentence. So John will say, we're both nice to each other at that point when it's finished. John will say, this sentence is beautiful and you wrote it. And I'll say, no, actually you wrote that sentence. So it goes back and forth so much. So it really, we don't sit there together and actually write together. Um, but we go back and forth so much. And thanks to track change, we're able to do this. So I don't know, I, I sometimes write alone now um, but it's much, much better to write with someone else. Does anyone else want to chime in with a question or, or drop something in the chat? I, I did put in a couple links in the chat box. If you are interested, the library does surveys, so please feel free to click one of the links in the chat box and and fill out a survey after this event to let us know how we did. Oh, we have a hand raised. Yeah, we have a hand raised. Um, you're welcome to go ahead and chime in. Thank you. Um, thank you for this work. Um, I have done some work in El Salvador in um, the region that you have worked in, in Cabanas and so forth and so I appreciate your work very much and I'm my question is how did you negotiate the delicacy of the people still living there for their safety I mean the this is not a story that's over in terms of the dangers and so forth and as people that live on this side of the border with these kind of privileges, I mean, how did you, can you give some examples of maybe how you negotiated difficulties around that? I mean, it's, it's such a responsibility to be putting somebody else's lives at stake when they have more st at stake than we do. Thank yeah, you. it's beautifully put there. And thank you for, for raising that. 
I'll, I'll, I'll say a word or two, unless Robin, you did you? No, did I'll you jump right after you. Yeah, um, which is for us in this book and also a book we did earlier on the Philippines, which also is a country where people are killed for standing up to, to the government or standing up to corporations. We found that the key to everything is to establish close relationships of trust. And by the way, for the first eight, eight years of this work, we was not in our head that we were gonna write a book, mainly because we were sure they were gonna lose. And so it's a less interesting book if they lose. Um, and so we were going down to work with people. To, they had asked us to do certain things. We were going down to learn what they were doing and then to report in. They wanted us to tell them everything we could about the company companies in the beginning and then everything about this tribunal. So we were we were exchanging information. We knew that it was an unsafe place. We stayed in this in the north in a sort of a compound of one of the groups that work there called the Association of Social and Economic Development. And you know they locked the front gates of this compound at night. None of them went out at night. We didn't go out at night. Um, and so we simply built trust and they came to trust us because we weren't, I mean, there's a problem with gringos in Latin America, which is usually they go down and tell people what to do. Ours was the opposite. They were asking us for assistance and we learned to, to trust them and they us and we share what we learned and, and vice versa. Once you're at that level, then it's so much easier to, it, to, to, to move on to something like a book. They felt they wanted their story told once they'd won. They wanted others in, in, in the world to, to be inspired by this. So they urged us to write the book. And that then made it also, I think some gringos get in trouble by going down and stealing people's stories. And we said, we'll do it, but we'll do it through narrative nonfiction by lifting up. There's six or seven main characters in this book. And the book is told a lot with their words that we've recorded through interviews with them. So that's the way we did it. I think they also, just a final point, I think they knew that that shining light on this and getting attention from major institutions, we got the major trade unions in the world and big environmental groups and so on, that that in its own way could offer some protection. I say that knowing that some incredible environmental activists have been assassinated in other countries, Berta Caceres in Honduras, after she won an award. So international attention does not always protect you, but I think they felt that it might help. And uh, I think in the end it did. Um, Robin, any, anything else? So let me just add briefly, we, as John said, it was not our intention to write this book. Our intention was given our professions to to work with them doing the global side of the work. So we, they had their coalition, La Mesa and El Salvador. We helped build a global coalition to work on the relevant mining companies and on that World Bank Group arbitration venue. And through that, through that going, going to El Salvador at least once a year and having them come come here, we actually, we became quite close. I mean, it, it, and the trust grew from, from that work. Once that, those victories happened, um, we wouldn't have written this book without their permission. They actually wanted the book written. They wanted the book written in English. They wanted Marcelo's, Miguel especially, wanted his brother to live on um, and the, the other families of people who were were murdered um, and they actually became in a way co-authors so they knew what we knew and they knew what we didn't know and we went down there until the pandemic um, while we were writing the, this book and they would bring us to places where key events happened that they knew we didn't know about those events. And they would say, okay, we're gonna take you know a six hour or a four hour drive and it's gonna be really muddy and cold and we're not sure we'll make it back. And John and I would look at the same night and John and I would look at each other and maybe one of us would say, do we really wanna do this? Um, but every place they brought us ended up being a key piece, a key 
a key part of either something we had to write about in the book or incredibly enough they trusted us with information that we chose not to put in the book confidential information because we felt it it was potentially too harmful for some people but they didn't say don't use this in the book they trusted us enough um, to just let us decide and then as, as we said I'll just tell as we said we brought Spanish language versions translated by by an amateur but um, but Spanish language versions of of the key chapters down and spent um, and they read it and they spent days reading it and um, one of the people we haven't talked about Antonio who heads up this place where we we stayed this development group um, he went through it in great detail giving us all the other things. We had a word limit by Beacon Press and Penguin Random House. And mostly what he wanted was for every one event, he wanted us to tell 10 more events. But, but there was one, which of course we couldn't do, but it was hard to explain word limits, right? But the, there was one very interesting thing where we had a, a section on Vidalina, who's one of our main characters. And in it, Vidalina is talking about how hard it was to work in this national coalition, the round table, how much, how important it was, but how hard it was because there were lawyers with degrees, it was mostly men, and she said the machismo gets really, really exhausting after a while. And Antonio said, Vidalina is not going to, Antonio, who is Vidalina's boss and friend, said, Vidalina is not going to want that, that in there. She's going to ask you to delete it. And then we met separately with Vidalina, and we didn't say Antonio said we should delete this. We, we kept asking her to reread those pages very carefully to make sure that what we said was what she wanted us to say. Um, at a certain point, one of us, I don't remember it was John or me, one of us asked us if she was sure that she wanted us to include those pages. And she said, of course that has to be in there. That's the reality. <laughs> so it's going, to be, it's going to be very interesting now that, I mean, this, this odd thing is happening, right? With the interviews, our interactions with them were in Spanish, often with the help of a translator. Um, we wrote in English. Now the book is retranslated, is translated into Spanish. We were fortunate enough to have um, part of our, our international allies group, the Global Coalition we helped build, is based in San Salvador. And so he brought, again, these Spanish translations, retranslations of their quotes, because we, didn't re we don't record we just take notes. Um, he brought it back to them to make sure that it was in Salvadoran Spanish and they were, they were okay with it. So it's a kind of interesting process and it's going to be even more interesting to see how others read, how they, they feel as they read the Spanish language version of, of their story. But we're hopeful that um, they'll feel very proud of what they were able to achieve. Does anyone else have any any last minute questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Mar Martha, are you talking or you're still muted just in case you're talking? Okay, I'm <laughs> just checking. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you everyone for attending and thank you Robin and John for, for being here and, and sharing the story of the water defenders. I will turn off the recording and just let me know if there's any, any last minute thoughts or anything you'd like to share. So I would just like to say to anyone in the audience, um, feel free to be in touch with us. Um, my just, I'm Robin Brog. Um, Google Robin Brog at American University and you'll find my email. Um, and YH, I'd be, we'd be especially interested in hearing about your work in Cabanas if you feel like sharing that. Um, I wonder if our paths crossed at any point.
I was focused on Coco C and uh, feminist groups in the capital as well, and how Coco C, which is a AIDS gender organization in this community where Robin and John were working, and how they transformed their community from a community where at 10 years earlier from when I started, there were young adolescent girls being pregnant and they changed the culture. So there were no longer 10 year old girls getting pregnant. In fact, there was a cultural change where ordinary community members would be talking that something, there was a miseducation of that child if she was pregnant at that young age. So it's the transformation of a community group that they can make to change the gender norms and pregnancy and things like that. And they have a group for men, you know, evolving around gender and trans people. And it's an amazing, amazing community with a long history of class, um, fighting against class oppression for generations. It's an amazing community. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And I would just say, well, first of all, thank you all for joining us. And it's been lovely having this conversation. And um, in our community here, just outside Washington, there's a group that brings youth from our area down to exactly this same, these same communities for the summer. And it's a beautiful experience for 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, and it changes the way they think about the world and about this, this country. So um, it's something we come out of this, well, we, our lives have been so enriched by our opportunities to live in places like the Philippines and El Salvador. And, and we're always looking for opportunities for younger people to have that, that same experience. Um, so thank you all and thank you so much, Lindsay, and, and good luck with the Palm Beach County Library system. Stay strong. Looking forward to when you're you're back in person. Thank you. We'll look you up in person next time we're done. We'd love to have you in person one day. <laughs> thank you all. Thank those of you who joined, and, and thanks to the Long Beach County Library for putting this together. Thank you thank so you. much, everyone, for attending, and Robin and John. Thank you. Talk to some of you soon. Bye.